Hello. Base. Are you there? How are you? Fine, thank you. How is everything? Been busy? Uh, yeah, I'm always busy. <laughs> always always, always busy. busy. That's that's good. And, uh, you know, Hellfire and Damnation, the new album is out. How's been the reaction so far? It's a monster, the album. It's, uh, it's had fantastic reviews and uh, it's gone in the charts all over Europe. So we're very happy. Does it surprise you? It's always surprising. It's like Lemmy said, everybody waiting for you to fall. So <laughs> when you don't fall, is always good, you know. So <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, it's always so, nice. Yeah, it's, it's always good to have a great album out, and uh, you know we know it's a great album. It's a magical album. We had great fun making it, and um, but it's always good when people, you know, agree with you. You know. Yeah. When did uh, you guys start working on the new songs? Not that long ago, really. We were taking our time, bringing the album out in November this year, and then we got together with Judas Priest and said, oh, let's do this tour together. Uh, in March, we were like, oh, man, we're going we're gonna to really go for it now to get the album together. So uh, we didn't finish recording this album Um I think probably the 10th of October, 10th, 15th of October of last year, which is not that long ago. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, very, very quick, the album. You know, the album for me, as you were saying, it's there's you talked about being magical. You guys seem to be very inspired on this, on this album. Is there any reason why you were so creative? Well, I think... I think all the all the guys in the band, um, you know, played fantastic on the album, and uh, th because the songs are um, because the songs are, um, you know, they they're not too difficult to play. These songs, uh, I think, that, that people were concentrating on the sound and playing. I mean, uh, you know, the guitars that were, they use. I mean, I think Brian used a, a Gibson Flying V predominantly. And, uh, you know, Doug used a Les Paul, Gibson Les Paul, and the Fender Strat predominantly. So uh, the sounds are quite retro 80 sounding, but much bigger, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Did you guys work? So I think, yeah, I, th I think the guys did really well recording the album. The guitar solos between Brian, Doug, and Paul are fantastic. You know, some of the best guitar playing you know i've heard on saxon albums for a long 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 time so i think it's great yeah do you guys work separately on the songs or you guys get together and work as a team well it's always done separately to start with all the ideas come in to me and then i'll sort through the different ideas and i'll figure out which ones i think uh you know i can take forward to do uh melodies and lyrics and and then when, when I've chosen the songs that I can actually uh, work with, that inspire me, then we'll get together as a band and then we'll play through them and work them out and do the fine details and and then record them straight away, actually, is what we did. Yeah. It, it, it's easier these days to just record. <laughs> I mean, with Pro Tools and, you know, the way technology is, it seems quite easy not to go into a studio and you know, record at home. Obviously, you need, you know, a guy like Andy Snip, like a professional guy, to do the mixing and mastering and everything. But it seems easier these days for anyone to record an instrument. I don't think anyone could have an album that sounded like this one, though. This one just sounds massive. I mean, sonically, it sounds massive, yep. and. Uh, you know, the way we recorded it and the way we wrote it was very live. You know, we rented a hotel and cinema in Germany in a small village. And uh, we used that cinema as our recording room and as our writing room and rehearsal room. So, uh, you know, the drums and bass were recorded there. Uh, the guitars were recorded at my studio, which is a big barn. So... Uh, you know, everything was recorded pretty loud. Yeah. Fast and loud is what we call it, you know. <laughs> Fast and loud, the best way to, to make albums. And uh, 
you know, we, uh, you know, we use we use the uh, we use a lot of analog and a lot of digital as well, which is what we always do. We 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 use the best of both worlds, you know. I mean, Andy has an analog desk, yeah, uh, that goes into Pro Tools, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have we have everything. We have outboard gear. We have you know digital software. You know, definitely we we cross the boundaries between you know retro and new definitely yeah. and uh you know on the songwriting process did uh, brian had a, a very active part in the in the writing process yeah i mean uh, i mean basically the main the main riff writers as you call them riff writers uh were brian doug and uh Nip. Uh, Brian brought three ideas to the table, and um, yeah, we, we co-wrote three songs with him basically. So um, yeah, he brought a lot to the table. I mean, he had some he had some good ideas that he'd never used, and we, I heard the ideas and thought, wow, you know, we have to use them. You know, uh, one of them was Hellfire and Damnation, the track, obviously, and the other one was Madame Guillotine, John. and Ten Sixty Six. You know. Uh, Uh, co-written with Brian, definitely. Well, that's, you know, that's nice. I, I really, you know, to pick like one song on the record, it's really impossible because all the songs are really, are really good. But um, did the, you know, having Brian, you know, as a new guy, but obviously like a very seasoned musician, you know, very experienced, uh, did that inspire you guys as well? Did that became like a challenge to, you know, Obviously, you guys know what you do, but uh, with Brian present, it make you guys like you need to up up our game now a bit more. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're on the wrong track there. <laughs> no, no. I know where you're coming from. No, because we'd already written eight tracks before Brian came along, so we were pretty much down the road musically. Uh, it's just you know I was like two ideas short of an of an album. What I thought was a great album, and uh, you know, when I heard the riff for Hellfire and Damnation, I was like, "Yeah, that's going to be a great song. I've got a great title for that. Let's arrange it. Let's, you know, let me write some lyrics for it." And uh, when it came from that, but um, no, I don't think it in inspired Nibs or Doug to write any different because yeah. I'd already, I already had their ideas, you know. Yeah. And Saxony is Saxony at the end of the day. So, <laughs> I mean, the problem is everybody's always looking for a reason why the album is so brilliant. <laughs> and I suppose the, the, the new factor is Brian. And uh, you can't take it away from Brian that, you know, those, those three songs have added a lot to the album, you know. Yeah. But I don't think it inspired the boys to write differently. I just think, yeah. you know, uh, something in Roswell is Nibs. You know, that's an Indian Nibs writing. Uh, supercharger with me and Doug, you know, Madame Guillotine is me, Doug and Brian. So, you know, it's it's a mixture, really. I don't think there's any, uh, there's no set rules. I can't yeah. say, oh, yeah, everything was really, you know, and then Brian joined, it was like, whoa, you know, so it wasn't really <laughs> like that. It, it just, uh, it just happened, you know, by accident, really, that yeah. Brian had a few ideas and Paul wasn't there. He was off doing his thing in Japan and uh, we wrote the album without him. Yeah. And realistically, you know, to be honest, like the, the last few Saxon records, they have been quite good as well, like really, really good. So, you know, I, I was saying that just you know, to have an idea if it would just spice things up, but you know, you guys are really in a good, in a good space anyway with, with or without whoever. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, Carpe Diem was a great album. Yeah. I mean, that came out of COVID. So that was a pretty magical album as well, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, do, I think this one is a different album. I wouldn't say it was any better yeah. or any worse. It's just a different album. It's the, it's the new Saxon album, which people yeah. always look forward to. And, uh, you know, because we're, we're never predictable, yeah. you know. So, uh, no, it's good that my album's a monster. I like it, you know. Yeah. And you know, with the you you guys have like this big tour in Europe with Priest and Uriah Hip. You know, with a record this good, yeah, and with Carpe Diem, as you said, being like a really, really good record, 
And without the back catalog and going back the years, it must be really painful to choose a set list, especially when you don't have like a full time to play. So for the upcoming tour with Priest, do you guys have any idea are you going to, you know, set list wise going to pick up the songs? Is going to be there in many new songs or just one and two? Do you have any idea yet? Well, normally when we turn a new album, we'll do six or seven new songs off the album. Because let's face it, it, it is the, you know, Hellfire Damnation World Tour. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's all part of the same thing. But we'll probably do, I would say we'll probably do five, six new songs on the tour. On the tour. You know, we'll probably be playing for over an hour, I think. So uh, we'll see what we can squeeze in, you know. Yeah. I'll try not to talk too much and play more songs. That, <laughs> I think that's the key. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, not get too carried away winding up the audience and getting them all to sing back and, you know, shouting and screaming. So we'll probably just keep to the music yeah. uh, rather than not so many uh, frontman things going on. But you never know. You know, uh, audiences can be crazy, <laughs> crazier than crazier than me. So, you know, you have to uh, see how it goes. Really. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on the, on the record, the intro prophecy is narrated by Brian Blessed. Um, how did this collaboration come up? I think in was Bloodstock 2021, he did the intro for you guys. Or something like that. Yeah, we've we've met him a few times. I've met him a few times at the award ceremonies in England. You know the the, the rock awards and things. And uh, I think we did some work with him in the nineties for ch for a charity for uh, coal miners. Uh, so we we have crossed his path quite a few times. So I thought we are friends, you know, uh, but not not bosom buddies, but yeah. we are friends. And, uh, you know, I've got his contact details in my phone. Like, you know, a lot of actors like to hang out with rock, rock bands. Yes. And a lot of rock bands like to hang out with actors. So, you know, I do have quite a few uh, people on speed dial on my phone, you know. So, um, so yeah, I sent him a message saying I've got this uh, thing, you know, this, uh, this, like, prologue that I want to do before the album. Uh you know, could you could you could you could you say it for us? Um, and he got back and said, "Yeah, of course I will." I mean, obviously he didn't do it for free, you know. But um, <laughs> he's very selective. If he didn't like the words, he wouldn't have done it, you know. So he quite liked the words. It's it's up his sort of street, you know. Yeah. Back in time, uh, you sound great, you know. Sounds brilliant, and the, the whole concept of that type of thing is very eighties. Yeah. So it, it really appealed to me to bring back that sort of, you know, I mean, uh, you know, thriller and number of the beast, you know, that sort of yeah. big intro thing. I, I do love it, yeah. especially when it's um, when it explains the song. Yeah. You know, I think uh, you know it works really well. I think it was a great setup for the, for, I, you know, again, it's as you said, it's not something that bands do these days. It's a, an 80s thing, but I think it just set up the record so nicely that, you know, sometimes you just need that little detail to grab you, to get your attention. And yeah. I, that intro did just that. It's just a crazy idea I had. I had a crazy idea, you know, I said, but start it with like, you know, synthesizer thing going on with some voices. I did some deep voices, you know, like demon voices on backwards, some software that me and Andy were having fun with. And uh, I did a few screams and things. And then I thought, I'm going to ask Brian to do the, the voiceover. Uh, so, yeah, it worked really well. And I mean, it could have gone like, oh, dear. <laughs> but actually, it sounds really brilliant. And it explains the first song. And I think it works really well, and I think it's going to be great live. Yeah. You know, because when people hear the voice, they're going to know immediately that what song's coming, you know, so <laughs> it's going to be great, you know. Yeah, I think it's it's very nice. And, uh, you know, there's something in Roswell, obviously, it's a self-explanatory song. Um, do you believe in aliens? <laughs> I'm a Roswell believer. That's what I am. 
I, I do sort of sort of believe in aliens, but uh, you know, and I sort of think I saw a UFO back in the day in the eighties in America, but I can't. I don't know. I'm like everybody else. Was it? Wasn't it? But I'm a Roswell believer. I think something happened at Roswell that got covered up very seriously, yeah. and uh, all that. Um, you know, in 1947, I mean, obviously I wasn't around then, but 1947 is ground zero Roswell for UFO enthusiasts. All starts from Roswell, yeah. really, and all that mysterious Area 51 all comes along after Roswell. So I think it's a great, great subject to sing about Roswell, because for a lot of people, it's, it's a really big mystery and an enigma. Yeah. Did something crash? Might have been, might have been a Russian jet. I don't know. Yes. It wasn't a. We I don't think it was a weather balloon. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what I'm yeah. talking about. I think there was something in Roswell. I'm a Roswell believer. So yeah. You know, for me, it's it's hard to believe that we would be the only sort of species, you know, in this vast universe. And billions it, of planets. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, they don't need to look like us. They probably don't need to breathe oxygen. You know, it's to think and limit ourselves that for a, a, a live being had to breathe oxygen could be very, you know, narrowing, so to say. And, you know, for me, I believe there's something out there. What is it? I don't know, because I never saw. Yeah, well, you know, things can live in water, can't they? They don't have to breathe. Yeah, you know, some 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 you know things are in water they never come for any air. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, I doubt this would be writing heavy metal albums all like we do. But <laughs> you, you never know. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> there might be some some really decent music out there in the universe. We just haven't discovered it yet. You know, there's probably a whole new genre of heavy metal out there that we don't know about. Yeah, maybe unless the band UFO were aliens, they might have been <laughs> aliens. I mean, well, I knew Pete Ware really well. He was a bit of an alien, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, for all we know, maybe Kiss avatars are already doing great gigs somewhere else. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and, you know, I love, one of the things that I love about sex and, you know, besides obviously the music, lyrically, there's a, a lot of history that stories that you like to tell and uh you know i appreciate that instead of just writing angry lyrics about politicians or about how miserable life is and i appreciate some little history lessons <laughs> that you that you like to to write about madame guillotine obviously uh marie antoinette um does like history is a, a big inspiration for you you get a lot you know, a good kick out of trying to write lyrics about history? Yeah, I like storytelling. And history is all about stories, you know. And I think I think between us and Iron Maiden, I think we pretty much uh, corner the market on history, metal, yeah. really. But I know some of the, the Scandinavian bands like Sabaton and, and one of them do quite a bit of history thing. But um, I think with the British... Uh, it's a bit of a British thing, this, uh, you know, historical uh, lyric thing. Uh, I get a lot of inspiration from history. I mean, everything's history once you've done it, though. Yeah. You know, I mean, th this is the beautiful thing about history, isn't it? You know, history is is happening all the time, you know. So, um, you know, Roswell's 1947, you know, it, it's just... Uh, it's just crazy, crazy. You can go back to like, you know, the 1066 and it's just, um, it's just a great thing to write about. And yeah. I find a lot of inspiration in it. And people do like it, you know, even if, if you don't know what I'm singing about, you can easily go on, on, you know, go on your search engine and Wikipedia will give you the whole story, yeah. you know, <laughs> everything. So it's quite interesting. You know, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a, like a, an end story. To all my stories, you know, I'm, you know, I'm keeping it to three verses, four verses, but the stories are much bigger than that. You know, yeah. you could, you could do a whole concept album <laughs> about 1066. You know, what happened in 1066? You know, do you ever thought about 
probably doing like a big concept record. Is that something that you find appealing or you just prefer to keep to the short stories, so to say? I think, I think to do it justice, we would have to have a keyboard element in the band. Uh, because to, to, for me, a concept album is more prog rock, yep. really. But, but that's just me. I mean, it might not be, but for me, uh, concept albums are more progressive rock than or progressive metal rather than street metal or street hard rock. So it would have to be something very, very musical for me to do a concept album. Uh, I mean, obviously, I can story tell that wouldn't be a problem. You know, we'd, we'd have to pick a subject like a 1066, something that had a lot of depth and a lot of history uh, and a lot of sub stories, you know. And, mm -hmm. But I think for me, a concept album and music would have to speak as well. You understand what I mean? Yeah. The music would have to create atmospheres and images. Yeah. So we'd have, we wouldn't be able to write it as like 10 separate songs. We'd have to write it as a concept. Although some bands just write 10 songs and then just put a bit of a bit of music in between the songs and yeah. call it a concept album. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to do that. If I was yeah. going to do it, I would want something like Close to the Edge, yes, or something like that, yeah. or, you know, Dark Side of the Moon or something. Something that connected, you know, through the through all the songs, you know, and, and took you on a journey. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 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 I understand that because I, I think really makes more sense. It's like watching a movie, you know, you don't cut scenes drastically, you know, there is a yeah. flow from start to finish. If you just do cut scenes that end up making no sense, it's not a movie. It's That's not right. Concept. There's nothing there. It's just, you know, pieces put together and yeah. know, <laughs> call it a I movie. Mean, I could I could have done, we could have done a concept. For the for the you know the good and evil the fight between good and evil yeah. which is what Hellfire Domination and songs about then that would have been quite a nice concept but it would have took me to different places but I'm quite happy where we are you know yeah. just making monster albums you know yeah. with history <laughs> <It's cool. laughs> cool. and you know let's just say if this was the last Saxon record which is not going to be. But if it was, uh, would you be happy with all that you achieved? Yes. If this was our last album, I'd be very happy. It would be a fantastic album to finish on, definitely, uh, to go out on a high. Uh, but we're already thinking of ideas for the next album already, so <laughs> we'll see where that one goes. You know, I it's for me, it's so inspiring to see like a band that could just live on playing Denim and Bladder or, you know, whatever album and live off that playing like those concept live shows, whatever it calls. But you guys are always pushing and making new music, which is, you know, I, I think it's inspiring even, you know, I'm getting old, but, you know, I wish younger bands would have that desire and hunger to create the way that you guys create. Yeah, I think I think you know younger bands have to have to grow into that sort of thing. I mean, uh, the thing is with with with, with us, we intrinsically know when a song is great, right? And because because um, because the the way that we write it all flows into me. <laughs> A lot of the time it's down to me to pick what goes forward to come on a song, yeah? And uh, I know what, I mean, I used to be a guitarist, so I know what a great guitar riff is. I know how hard it is to play, and I know where, and if it, if that guitar riff moves me, you know, to, it inspires me to write a song like Hellfire and Damnation, and that's where you need to be. You can't fool yourself. Yeah. You've got to be honest with yourself. Is this song good or is it a piece of shit? That's, that's what you have to say to yourself, yeah? Yeah. As a band, yeah. Because we don't we don't do the each member writes two songs. I know some bands do that, you know, but we don't. We have a we have a uh, sort of system that goes through the singer, which is me. And that's I think that's 
sometimes why we can hone things down to being really focused, you know, because we're not on a, uh, we're not on an individual ego thing with Saxon. We all work together as Saxon to produce a great album. You know, if one guy writes more ideas than the other guy, we're not bothered. It doesn't matter. You know, there's no, there's no jealousy within Saxon on that score. You know, that's, you know, that's great to, to hear. And uh, obviously, you know, We talked about the tour with Priest and Uriah Heep. You're going to the US with Uriah Heep. You guys seem to be like, you love to be on the road. <laughs> well, the thing is, when you have a new album, you know, the, ju the juice, it gives you the juice, gives you the adrenaline to go on the road and play it, you know. And it might be, it might be old school now to go on the road and promote an album, but that's what we're doing. Yeah. You know, that's the whole point of the story. You know, we don't, we're not going, we're not going out just to play Wheel to Steel and, and Denim and Leather every night. We're going out to promote the new album. Yeah. You know, we are going to play some of the big hits from the 80s, but, you know, that's, that's because people want to hear them, you know, but I think people are going to want to hear their song, new songs as well, as yeah. well, you know. You know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if you played all 10 songs live on a, on a subsequent tour uh, that you guys may do, because I think this album is that good that it would fit among the, you know, amongst the classics that you guys have easily, you know, easily. You can play these songs in between Demon and Leather, Wheels of Steel, Princess, yeah. whatever, and, you know, they would fit perfectly and no one would, uh, even if someone was watching for the first time, They probably would say that's a classic song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. I mean, you are right. We could play all 10 songs, but there's no songs there that we've played them all live anyway, you know, before we recorded the album. So we know they all work fantastic live. Um, so, yeah, we could. And we may well do. You know, yeah. when we start headlining uh, after summer, And we could well play, uh, you know, we could well play 10 songs because, you know, when we headline, we'll probably play 18, 20 songs. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a problem with nine of them being your songs, you know. Exactly. I think it would be, be great. So the plans after the summer, it's to, like, prepare a proper European headline tour. Is that anything set in stone yet? Uh, no, no, nothing yet. We're working on it now. You know, we're talking to Jap Japan, maybe going there and... You know, we will do some more headline shows, definitely. Um, you know, we're doing some, we're doing a few headline festivals, actually. We're doing, we're doing, uh, we're doing the big Hellfest in France. And we're doing one down in Spain as well, uh, uh, a big Imperium. headline festival. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't, we're not doing Portugal, though, are we? Yeah. I, I know you're from Portugal, aren't yeah. you? But uh, it's difficult to get shows in Portugal. I mean, the only thing the gigs would get often in Port, like biker festivals. You yeah. know? There's, the only, there's nothing wrong with biker festivals. But I know, but they seem to be the only people that actually realize that Saxon writes great music down there. So, but it, you know. it, it is weird because I obviously I have a lot of people that I know that are metalheads and they keep asking about Saxon. And I'm saying, you know, just fucking annoy the promoters and say that you want <laughs> and you know don't just go on facebook or whatever and say like oh why saxon is not playing porch you know just send an email send emails yeah interest because you know otherwise it, it's and this day and age we, we know that agents play a big part in how some festivals are done and if you don't work with a booking agent that doesn't have Saxon or, or something, you know, it's very unlikely you left Saxon if you don't work with him. You need to find, you know, it's, it's, I know it's difficult, but you know, I would love, I go to, I, you know, we talked last year and, you know, I went to Ireland to see you guys play at the, the Olympia. It was a fantastic show. And I'm going to Dublin again in March to see the show with Priest because, right. you know, it's not coming to Portugal. You know, it's fine. I'll just fucking travel and just enjoy. Yeah, great. It, it's strange because there aren't festivals in, in Portugal, and we, you know, we could play. I mean, quite a lot of German bands play there from our era. 
you know. So I can't see why Saxon can't get down there. I think maybe in the 90s, perhaps we went to Portugal a couple of times, yeah. and it was in that period where nobody really gave a shit yeah. about British metal anymore. So maybe we, uh, you know, I know Motorhead, you know, didn't do very well in Portugal either yeah. when they used to go there. So um, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe we were just, they were just into death metal at that time or something else, you know, and it went over their heads a bit. But uh, it sounds right now, you know. For yeah. Portugal to come back to the family, so we yeah. should be playing a festival in Portugal, definitely. Yeah. There's still time. Yeah, it's only yes. January. <laughs> you know, people have to get uh, get involved and get some uh, get some stuff on Facebook and social yes. media and send some emails out. Uh, yeah, we'll de- if somebody offers us a good show, we'll definitely come. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, we have to work on that. Beef, thank you very much for your time. Uh, all the best for Hellfire and Damnation. I'll see you in March in Dublin. Uh, I'll try. Yeah. I'll try to be in the pit to take photos. I have to go through Judas Priest first <laughs> to get to get the mission, and then everything will be easier. So it's the tough part. Yeah. It's to reach the, you know, I already talked with the label, but you have to go to the management and it's always take their time. You have to go through everybody, mate. Yeah. It's, it, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it yeah. is. <laughs> Anyway, you can take as many photographs of Saxon as you want, by the way. We're <laughs> okay with that. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, I'll see, okay. you, I'll see you in Dublin in March. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can bring you guys to Portugal because it's long due that you guys play here. You know, it's about freaking time because, you know, time is running out for all of us. And we never know if a pandemic comes out. And this is the Monster album, so it should definitely come to Portugal. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Beef. Have a great All right. evening. And I great hope talking to you. I'll see you, see you later. In Dublin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.